thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you, um, our guests, for being here um, and for everyone who is in the audience. Um, as we um, move forward, I am Jack Soto. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Career Readiness and Employment at the American Indian College Fund on the Student Success Services team. Um, we've asked a variety of schools over the past few months to sort of share information, well, to actually share information about their programs and any hints and tips about applying to school, medical school is so specific, and we wanted to sort of give a little bit of um, opportunity for a deep dive into what this looks like for students who are thinking about med school. We've also got some um, other programs that are not necessarily, you know, on the track to surgeon, but, you know, dentist and um, um, physical assist or uh, physician's assistants are some that are um, are really attractive to some of our students. And then we have a program, we have um, Danielle here from the University of Wisconsin who has a, is an in-med program and is a native centric program. So um, with that, I just wanna take a moment for us just to sort of come together. I want you to um, think about the land that you're on and think about the um, people that you're bringing in with you today, your ancestors, your uh, relatives, your families, um, um, acknowledge them and ask them to help you sort of uh, be here and to learn what you're supposed to learn and help us to um, come together to um, find a pathway to what the, the takeaways are from today. So I wanna thank you all for being here and uh, we'll go ahead and start. I don't have a lot of preface to the way that the presenters will be chatting. I, I basically told them that what we would like is to have an overview um, and of course, you're always welcome to uh, put questions into the chat box and we will, we'll, um, I'll be help facilitating that. And uh, we'll start off with um, Harvard University School of Medicine, and then we'll go to um, A.T. Stills University, and then we'll finish off with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I guess I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Christopher. Um, and if you want to, as we go through, introduce yourselves, that'll be um, fine. Great, thank you Jack, happy to be here. Glad that those of you who are watching now or at some point in the future are checking things out. So hopefully it's a sunny day whenever you're watching, it's a sunny one here in Boston right now. Um, so as mentioned, I'm with the Office of Recruitment and Multicultural Affairs at Harvard Medical School. Um, my colleague Haley is specifically with the MD PhD program. So I'll wrap up and then she'll cover some specifics about that. So it'll be a little bit of overlap, um, but hopefully it'll help make things clear um, again, you can always rewind and watch again. You can always reach out. My email address will be on the screen in just a second. Um, so I think a couple of things that are always important to mention um, is depending on when you're applying to this, uh, watching this, of course, a couple of years, maybe we won't have to think about the COVID resource hub anymore. Uh, but right now, especially thinking about medical school, um, you know, looking at the AMC website and searching for that COVID resource hub, and it really gives you a good idea of uh, what changes, what updates. Some of these things like the visiting students uh, is more when you're in medical school. So when you get there, um, hopefully this hub will really be gone, but things about MCAT, the fee assistance program and the application, you'll see if there's any substantial changes to timelines. Uh, and I think each centralized application service for other health professions probably has a version of this. So um, you know, seek that out and keep up to date. Um, just a little bit about our office. We really work on supporting our URIM and LGBTQ uh, pre-meds and current students. And we do that through group events one-on-one -on -one work all the way from I'm interested in medicine through I'm a student on campus and we also serve just as a hub for um, finding other resources I don't know what I need let's help assess it out and navigate your way uh, around Harvard Medical School and the larger Harvard ecosystem. Um, just kind of the people with within our office um, that's our director Dr. Reed she's also a gastroenterologist at MSU's General Hospital um, she's the second director actually in the history of the office Dr. Alan Poussaint was with us for 50 years 5-0 um, and he retired just a couple of years ago. She's also an HMS alum. And then myself and Barbara Sweeney are full-time staff members. And we have three uh, faculty advisors. They all happen to be pediatricians at the moment, uh, but all of our students have access to, uh, to our faculty advisors throughout the year from everything from personal to uh, professional questions, um, chatting, checking in, whatever is sort of needed. So we really try to take a one-on-one -on -one touch and then design some group events, really leaning on our uh, greater connections of faculty and um, different specialties and, and we can kind of get into what that might look like. And our unofficial staff member is my dog, Daisy. Um, so, you know, whenever you're at HMS for any reason, uh, maybe you happen to come to town for the uh, Four Directions Summer Research Program, uh, potentially uh, you could stop by the office and meet Daisy and say hi. You don't even have to talk to me, which is I think sometimes one of the students' favorite things. In terms of student organizations, our four primary um, student groups that we support are the Latino Medical Student Association, 
LGBTQ and allies at Harvard Medical School, the Native American Health Organization, and the Student National Medical Association. And similar to the way we advise our individual students, uh, with our student groups, um, it can vary. Uh, sometimes I'm just uh, helping them spend our money, right, so they can buy lunch for each other, have community building events, um, right, pay, you know, an invoice for a translator for a community focused event, really kind of whatever students might need on that front. And other times I'll work a little more closely and partner with our student groups when they're designing something and figure out how can I best leverage, you know, the technology that we have available and maybe the region within the Harvard ecosystem and across the different schools or contacts that I have with other um, places as well for invitation. So it can be pretty broad, but those are four uh, core groups. There's also the Women of Color in Medicine and Dentistry, um, tends to be led by third and fourth year students. So they're uh, thinking about residency and the next steps, and we help them connect with our faculty and alumni. And the other big piece that we do do is reach out to our URIM and LGBTQ alum and have find ways for them to connect with our current students and then try to connect our students across all four years. And then for those of you that will, you know, may end up at, at Harvard Medical School, you'd have the option to be a part of the uh, Poussin Prematriculation Summer Program. And this is the group from 2019. Uh, last year, you know, in 2020 was virtual, so they weren't in the same space on campus together. Um, but they actually spent a month between Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, learning about all things oncology, uh, learning about the transition to medical school, everything about HMS, life in Boston. Um, so you get to do some really cool clinical stuff, some shadowing, and you also just get to have fun in Boston with your peers as well and really start to make some connections early on. So that's for those who have been admitted to HMS and uh, decide to attend. So you can definitely uh, take a look at that. Uh, I think another big component thinking about uh, things at HMS uh, would be sort of where career advising falls in. I sort of mentioned there's some one-to-one -one things that our faculty members do as well. Um, there is stuff built in across your time at Harvard Medical School. Um, where you're going to learn about just what does, uh, what comes after your four years in medicine, uh, what is residency, what are specialties, there are panels, there are one-on-one -on -one conversations, there's interview practice, so there's things built into um, your time at HMS where you're going to learn about um, different components of that. And then a quick overview of sort of some things medical school, um, really just thinking about our class size, um, so the Pathways program is, uh, is generally around 135 students. The HSD, and I'll go into what these are in just a second, uh, is roughly around 30 students, give or take each year. And the MD PhD program, I think, can fluctuate from year to year. So that's roughly the class size that you're looking at, give or take a few students. Um, and then during the first year, you actually have students from the dental school in your classes as well. So any of you maybe listening that are interested in going into dentistry, um, you spend your first year um, not at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, but actually at the medical school um, before you transition right next door to, to, your, to your medical uh, excuse me, to your dental training. Um, the other thing that I know people are looking at is GPA, which can kind of scare people at times, just know that is an average. And we 100% have students uh, with lower GPAs that are happy and successful uh, at HMS that turn us down that have lower GPA. So don't look at that number and think that I can't get into Harvard Medical School. Um, one thing I can guarantee is if you don't apply to HMS, uh, that's a guaranteed way that you're not gonna get in. So um, definitely reach out if you have questions about things. Um, and then something else to point out as well is in terms of um, financial aid. Uh, for a private school, if you look at sort of that bar on the left and what that looks like, and I'll talk a little bit more about financial aid briefly in a second, but I think those are the types of things that you definitely want to be looking at. Um, and then thinking about the idea of what it means to come to HMS and, and be a Harvard doctor, um, I think the biggest thing is that uh, the overarching thing is you're learning to learn how to be a physician. Um, you're sort of always going to be in training, right, learning new uh, modalities, therapies, right, keeping up with things. If you're, if you're making research or a strong component of your uh, of your time as a clinician, then you're always gonna right, constantly be building, learning, and uh, putting out new information. So that's one of the core components. Uh, things are really built around um, you know, small group work during your first year, um, where you're gonna, what's the one time you'll be in sort of a classroom um, four days per week, and really in small groups, uh, you know, engaging with your peers. There will be some larger lectures when maybe we have some specialists coming in or some um, you know, people with a very specific background. But otherwise, you'll get to spend a lot of time getting to know uh, getting to know your classmates and your peers. Uh, uh, the curriculum, something that's just really important to know because it can feel a little confusing when you're looking at our website, is that there really is a single MD program at HMS and there are two curricular tracks. So pathways um, would be my, what you consider the regular, if you will, um, pathway for, for that MD, and then the health science and technology program that's a joint between Harvard Medical School and MIT um, that has a little bit more time built in for research. Uh, and then under either under either, you can also apply for the MD, the Harvard MIT MD PhD program. And as I mentioned, my colleague Haley will go a little more in depth into that. So just kind of keep that in mind. And what does that mean in terms of applying? It means that you could theoretically apply to the Pathways program. 
Health Sciences Technology Program and the MD PhD program. Um, that wouldn't be detrimental to your application as a whole. We wouldn't sort of you know, look badly upon somebody applying to all three. Just know that if you do, that means that you're filling out some additional, right? You're writing a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit, an extra essay for the health science technology program. And you're writing, you know, at least two more essays for the MD PhD program. So you're adding a little bit of work, but it's not necessarily, it's not inherently a negative for your application. And in terms of the curriculum, it's really built in the three big phases. There's the pre-clerkship, as I mentioned, you'll be in class uh, four days per week. And so it'll feel sort of structurally like, um, you know, your undergraduate experience or your graduate experience for those of you that might be doing uh, master's degrees of some sort or post -backs. Um, Then you'll shift into what we call the principal clinical experience or the PCE. And that's where after your first calendar year, you're jumping right in, you're jumping right into the clinic. And so you'll be, you'll be in one of our clinical sites. Uh, you also have the option the summer before you start to get in the uh, lottery for the Cambridge Health Alliance, which is a really cool option where you'll spend a year essentially with your patients. Um, so you'll really get to see what things look like over the course of, of their care over the long term. Um, you'll still get to rotate through the different specialties and sort of, uh, you know, what is surgery like? What is radiology like, right? What is primary care? So you'll still get those individual things, but you get this really cool component where you can uh, see what's going on long term. Um, but again, that's stuff that you'll find out uh, as you're coming in HMS. Um, and that's, a, that's about a calendar year. And then you'll hit that post P PCE phase where you'll really get to sort of start to fine tune um, as you develop your interests in you know, specialties and in research areas where you can really fine tune your, um, your education a little bit more. And that's also the time where um, people might uh, do a visiting rotation to some other part of the country, another medical school, another hospital. Um, and if you, there's also a really good video uh, out on our website as well that walks more in depth through the curriculum. Um, our current uh, our current Dean, uh, Dean Hundred actually is narrating the video, does a really good job, I think, of walking you through that. So definitely check that out. And I think some broad tips uh, that come up, you know, sort of like the things to really think about, not just HMS, but medical school, about how do I navigate this really successfully? Um, you know, I think number one is to get organized and stay organized. Um, as you'll see in a second, there's a ton of moving pieces um, for the application process as a whole. And as you hear from different medical schools, you'll hear we each have slightly different, um, you know, components. It's all the same in a lot of ways but we might have different deadlines, different character counts even. Um, so figure out how to stay organized with all of your dates and deadlines and, and word counts and you know, how many letters recommendation, the whole bit. So figure out what works. Um, you know, talk to older students who have been through the application process, um, current medical students, uh, they'll quite often share a version of their spreadsheet and like they have, everybody has their way to keep organized. So um, definitely keep on top of that. Another key piece I think is really identifying your support network and in different ways. And so, right, who can you go to for advising? and for just general advice. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're a little bit different, um, right? How are you gonna celebrate things and who can you celebrate with, right? You know, opening your application, um, submitting it, right? Your first interview, those are all things that you should celebrate a little bit. So figuring out who in your community can you do that with. Um, I know sometimes if you're the first person to navigate this process, um, it can be really challenging for you know, extended family, parents even to know what's happening. So you kind of give them a role, right? So that's that, give people a role. Um, let them know that here's this big this big component that I've made it through. Um, let's just sort of celebrate and be excited that you know, I've made this next step. Um, and then know who and what to avoid when you're stressed. Um, that's sort of another big component as well, because there'll definitely be some stress throughout this process, you know, as you're preparing. So just kind of keep an eye on what things raise your stress levels versus bring them down um, and sort of, you know, adjust your lives accordingly if you can. As I mentioned, you want to celebrate um, your progress throughout the process. It doesn't have to be a big expensive party. It might just mean, uh, right, that, uh, you know, you go out and do something a little bit longer outdoors. Maybe you read an extra comic book, watch an extra movie, maybe a little ice cream, whatever the case is, right? Just those small things that keep your spirits up and keep you going forward. Uh, and I definitely suggest doing that. Um, and as you're doing all this, um, continue to pursue your interests. Uh, the other big question I think we get asked is, um, you know, what do I need to do to stand out or to have Harvard uh, recognize me or notice me? And I think one of the big things that's clear from all of our students is that, yes, they've constantly pursued their interest in medicine and becoming a physician, uh, but they've also pursued other things that, you know, on the surface can look like, well, that doesn't have anything to do with medicine. Um, you know, what does, you know, being a teacher for a year or two or being in a non-biomedical research lab or working in a job that's completely outside of medicine or clinical care have to do with anything. And it's, you know, each student has their reasoning for that. So definitely continue to pursue those interests even when they feel uh, potentially disconnected from your future as a clinician. Um, you can always find time to keep a hand on your interest in medicine, but um, definitely don't think that everything has to be built around it. Uh, a quick note on financial aid. For HMS, we are a need-based campus. And what that means is that there's some paperwork we will collect from our admitted students and we'll calculate a package um, completely based on need. So something that you know you might hear or have read on the internet, 
um, is that you can negotiate a financial aid package with your institution. And, and that may be the case for some, for HMS it's not. Um, any changes to your package would be based on new information about sort of your financial situation. Um, the other big thing to know, uh, the other side of that is that there is merit-based aid and for campuses that have that, um, they can base it in any number of different ways. So you wanna check their individual websites, talk to their financial aid offices, see what they have online about um, what their merit process might look like and um, what types of awards uh, they're building under and around merits. Um, and just know that financial aid officers are also there to help you. It can feel scary to share all this financial information. Um, they can feel like they're gonna get me and they're just out to sort of uh, trip me up and keep me from being success successful. But uh, you know, the opposite is really true. Um, you know, they want to try to help you navigate this process and make the most sense of it. Um, and just know that financial aid officers can't give you too much info until you've been admitted to their medical school and have started submitting information. So don't take it personally if you reach out and somebody says, look at our website. Um, it's not that they don't like you, it's that we don't have enough information to build a package and really give you an answer. So that's kind of um, where that's coming from. Uh, and I think the other, I'll go to flip two more pieces here and then I'll um, hand it over to to Haley, I think um, when you're thinking about exploring medicine, and I mean more broadly, not just medical school, um, you know, experience is really one of the best ways to try to do that. Um, and I know that can be really challenging that right now, right, where it's, uh, there's a lot of things we can't do because of COVID and being in a clinical setting is really at the, at the top of that. Um, you know, so it's gonna look a little bit different. Just know that every medical school is gonna navigate that sort of this weird, crazy, you know, 12, 13, 14 months in people's, you know, CVs, resumes, experiences uh, in any number of different ways. Um, so you're, we're all going to be going to, through that together in some way. Um, but that could be vol volunteer work, paid work. Um, it could be you know, exposure to an issue or a population, a specific clinical role. Um, and the, something to really focus on is the difference between like shadowing and volunteering. Generally speaking, shadowing is, is, is usually a short term and kind of a limited run thing, maybe like half a day, a day at the most, where you're, as the name sounds, you're shadowing, you're following a clinician around in some way. The specifics might look a little different from clinician to clinician and type of clinician to type of clinician. Um, you might often be able to schedule it directly with somebody um, versus having to go through an office. But again, that can vary a little bit by hospital, by region, uh, by profession and everything. So kind of just keep an eye on that. Um, so it usually happens once or twice here or there. Um, and then volunteering might be a little bit longer term. Uh, it might be connected to like some sort of a volunteer or community engagement office at a hospital or a clinic. It kind of depends on their structure. Um, there's usually an office and sort of a person in a paid position maybe who helps navigate all of that. Um, and that can vary quite a bit. Uh, you know, I've talked to, uh, you know, advisees in the past who've been able to engage with patients in some manner. And I've talked to others who've been put in, uh, in the gift shop, uh, you know, volunteering and selling stuff. So it can vary quite a bit. So kind of, you know, poke around and see what that looks like um, before you commit uh, long-term to anything. And then of course you could be paid in any number of ways, especially if you're, uh, you know, licensed to say, we see a lot of e EMTs applying or coming through that sort of thing. Maybe you're transitioning from another field as well. And there are definitely non-clinical experiences that could be super valuable as well. So again, don't discount those. Um, you know, a kind of an example you can think of is if you're interested in being a pediatrician and you spend a lot of time engaging with kids in like an educational context, a lot of that really can translate over to that long-term interest. Um, there's some definitely some value there, right? Anytime you're engaging with your community or a community, um, that's about, you know, that uh, you want to work with long term, that stuff is all really valuable. So don't uh, discount it. And if you have the option to connect with different types of clinicians, I would definitely say take that. Um, you'll learn about, you know, how does uh, a physician, uh, a nurse and say a physical therapist, how do they engage with their patients differently, right? What does that look like for them? And how does that differ from say a physician assistant? They're all going to be a little bit different. So you can still learn something even if you know your goal is being a physician and you have access to other clinicians, definitely take it. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, seek out experiences that uh, are of interest to you and really fill in the gaps. And the last one here, really just thinking about timelines, um, you know, sort of like a really basic overview of the components and the chunks is that you have a primary application that goes through AMCAS and that's used for MD programs. The DO programs have a different, uh, different centralized application and a slightly different process. Um, so I won't try to go over that, um, but really it's a, that's where you start with everything and you can apply to all the medical schools that way and includes all that basic information, including courses, work and activities, right? That's where you're gonna pick which schools you're gonna to apply to. That's where you're gonna write your, submit your personal statement, um, write your MCAT score, your letters, things like that. Um, and so that'll go in and then each campus will have a secondary application and these can vary quite a bit. Um, for HMS, we have two questions in the secondary application. Um, I've heard up to four or five. 
our word limit, our character count is 4,000 characters. Um, you know, those can be as low as 1,000 up to five or 6,000. It kind of depends um, quite a bit. There might be some additional demographic data, some secondary essay questions as well, and that'll be for each um, campus. And sort of a note on cost is that you'll pay for each school you apply to through AMCAS, and there's usually a fee for each secondary application. Um, so it can add up quite a bit pretty pretty quickly. So something definitely to look at is the fee assistance program uh, on the AMCAS website. Um, so definitely take a look at it. Um, you know, free MCAT prep materials, a lower cost MCAT fee. Uh, MSAR is something that gives you a ton of data about the different medical schools. Um, you can apply up to 20 medical schools are covered if you're part of that fee assistance program. Um, most medical schools will just weigh that secondary fee right away. Usually if they don't, you can sort of send them an email or give them a call. Uh, and quite often we will do that um, right away as well. And for those of you applying right now, um, just really important dates for the upcoming cycle. It opens uh, right around the corner on the 3rd. That means you can start working on it. The 27th, you can actually hit submit. So that would be one of those, May 3rd might be a day you celebrate that you open an application. 27th may be a day or sometime after where you celebrate that I hit submit. Um, the 25th, you won't really know what's happening, but information will be sent over to the individual schools. Um, for schools that do early decision, August 2nd is the deadline. We do not. Um, and then you'll start hearing from um, schools about secondaries uh, sometime in July. So I'm going to, um, there's a ton more content we can cover, but I know uh, my colleagues have a lot of great stuff that they can offer as well. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen here and hand it over to Haley to talk a little bit more about the MD PhD program. Christopher, there's a real quick question and all of you can sort of add your insight. Um, when's a good time to start um, preparing or practicing for their studying for the MCAT? Yeah, so uh, if you could have the idealized timeline in terms of when to take it, when to apply, things like that, um, then if you could, the summer before you plan on applying, you were thinking about like sort of maximizing your time. And I know like if your eyes bug out when I said that out loud, it's okay. Because um, I know a number of, you know, our, the students at HMS right now, they've taken it in February, March, April of the year that they've applied. Um, I wouldn't go any later than maybe March or April. Um, one of the big reasons is that you won't know your score when the, when the application opens to work on it. So what you'd want to be able to do is, at a minimum, have your score before you submit your application so you can decide, uh, does that score reflect, you know, my ability? You know, maybe something happened, maybe you got sick, your power is out for a couple of days, and right, you just couldn't function as a normal person for those three or four days leading up to the exam, and, you know, you go into it really not at 100% sort of physically and mentally and spiritually, so you know you need to retake it. Um, so you want to give yourself, I think, that buffer. And then in terms of studying, once you figure out when you might take it, um, then you can sort of you know, sort of work backwards from there and how far out is that? How much time can I dedicate per week or day to studying? Um, there are some great sort of free study guide stuff online. Uh, you can sort of search some of those things out to give you some time windows. Um, and then certainly if you're using a paid service of some sort, which you don't need to do, but if you do, there are some that'll give you like, if you're taking in three months or six months and they'll kind of walk you through uh, those components. Thank you, Haley, you can go ahead. Uh, there's another question, but I'm going to wait for that one. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jack and Christopher. I'm going to also share some slides. So just hold on one minute here while I get myself set up. And okay. Uh, great. Is that visible to, to you? Can you see the slideshow? Great, wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, so my name is Haley Nicolosi and I'm the admission specialist at the Harvard MIT MD PhD program. And our program is looking to for students with a deep passion and commitment to a dual physician scientist career. So what that means is people who are interested in clinical um, experiences and also at the same time research. We're a community of 195 students, and you'll see our students there. They're actually jumping for joy uh, outside of Gordon Hall, which is kind of the, the center of the Harvard Medical School quad there. Um, and our community is made up of a diverse student body. And in this student body, 51% uh, identify as male and 49% identify as female. We have 16% of students who are underrepresented in medicine, 1% uh, who are doctor recipients, we have uh, students that are coming from 34 states, including DC and 12 countries. And we also have a 6% international student body. 
Um, these students represent 54 undergraduate institutions and come to us with a GPA range of uh, 3.6 to 4.0, and their MCATs are between 85 to 100%. Also, 96% of our incoming students are science, math, or engineering undergrad majors, and we have 39% of our student body that are affiliates. And what that means is that we have an open tent policy in our program. And that means if you come to HMS without funding for your MD, PhD, we still welcome you into our community to attend our social events and take advantage of our administrative support as well. To focus on the MD portion of the MD PhD program, uh, similar to what Christopher was saying, there are two MD curriculum tracks. There's the Pathways program and there's the Health Sciences and Technology program, which is also called HST. I'm going to speak a little bit more about each of these. Um, with, in regards to our program, um, admission to our program is contingent upon getting admitted to the Pathways or the HST program. Um, as Christopher mentioned, you can apply uh, to all three, Pathways, HST, and the MD-PhD program. There's absolutely no disincentive. And from our program's perspective, we're completely neutral in terms of which pathway uh, you elect to pursue. It's really based on what learning method you think is going to work best for you, the community that's involved there, um, and what you're hoping to focus on with your studies. A little bit more about each of these programs pathways, um, as mentioned, is 135 students a year. So that is the larger of the two curriculum tracks here. It's a more traditional approach to uh, the medicine there. It's hands on. You're kind of in clinic right away. Um, there's a flipped classroom model. And it also features a new curriculum that launched in August of 2015. Whereas our HST program, you'll see it's much smaller. It's 30 students a year. It's running collaboration with an MIT. It's more quantitative. It's really focused on training physician scientists. They go down to um, a molecular base. It's much more memorization, lecture-based learning and small groups. Um, but in, in terms of our student population, what you can see here is that Pathways is about 34% of MD, PhD students, uh, which is interesting when you look at the MD class, it's actually about 80% of the MD class, and the HST program is 66% of MD, PhD students, or about two thirds of our student body, uh, compared to only 20% of the overall MD student body there. For your clinical training, there are five different sites. Uh, this is a map of Boston for those of you who may not be familiar uh, with the city. And the first site that you can do some clinical training in is the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, or affectionately called sometimes the BI. And you'll see it's right over there. And our campus is actually right next door to that. Uh, right around there, we're in something called the Longwood Medical Area, which is very convenient because we're right by all the hospitals. Uh, there's also Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is right next door. Uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, you'll see, is a bit cross town. It looks like it might be a little far away, but it's completely accessible with public transit. Um, and if you're feeling very ambitious and the weather's nice in Boston, which is always a bit of a toss up, uh, you could always walk. <laughs> Um, we also have Boston Children's Hospital, which is back in the Longwood Medical Area. And then across the river, we have the Cambridge Health Alliance, which Christopher talked about a little bit earlier. Um, all of these provide you with access to thousands of faculty members and really exploring all sorts of things, whatever your research interests may be. In terms of prerequisites for the MD program, um, I have an email address up here. This is the general HMS admissions office. They're a really wonderful resource for specific questions you may have regarding your application to an UDMD program. You can see some of the prerequisites listed up here. Uh, we also do require the MCAT, and there are letters of recommendation that are involved as well. Um, but this is just a, a little snapshot overview of some of the common prerequisites. Switching gears to the PhD portion of our program, you'll see here we have our most common PhD programs listed. This is not an inclusive list. The first two columns that you see are our basic science program. And this last column here is social sciences. So when you apply to the MD PhD program, you're also picking if you want to pursue a basic science track or a social science track. We support both. Um, and this gives you an idea of some of the most common programs of interest amongst our students. Um, we have over 25 different PhD curriculum tracks you can 
pursue. So really, you can go in any direction you want. And if there's something that's not represented here, we're more than happy to chat with you and kind of help you find the way uh, to getting to what you're looking to research. To give you an idea of how our student body breaks down, 87% of our students are on a basic science track and 13% of our students are on a social science track. Either way, um, you're gonna be in good company. In terms of PhD prerequisites, there you have to choose one track to apply to. So you can either do basic science or social science. And in either situation, um, if you're not sure which one might be the best fit for you, definitely reach out to us. Our email address is, is right up there and um, I'll probably be replying to you or our director of administration, Amy, and we're more than happy to have a conversation with you about what makes sense with what you're looking to pursue. Um, the basic sciences, you do not need to submit a separate application for graduate school at the time of application, so that's nice. Um, and But for social sciences, it depends on the program. You'll see down here listed, there are a few that are bolded that you don't need to submit a separate application for. And there are some programs, though, um, in the social sciences that you will need to submit a separate application at the time um, of applying to medical school. And if you have any questions about that, again, please feel free to reach out to us. It can get a little confusing and that's what we're here for. Um, but some common things that might be required if you have to do another application include a writing sample, a CV, um, or maybe sometimes even the GRE. And we can point you to the correct contacts to help you out. And again, we're always here as a resource as well. In terms of the application process, just to kind of build off of what Christopher started with introducing, is the first thing you're gonna do is apply via AMCAP, which is the American Medical College Application Service. This is what all the, the medical applications are run through. And you're gonna do it in the spring of the year prior to matriculation. So this spring, we're gonna get students who are interested in matriculating in 2022. After that, you're going to submit your MCAT scores, your transcripts, supporting materials, and then these are submitted by AMCAP to the individual schools. It goes through something called the verification process. After that, the school will issue the secondary application. So uh, in this case, it would be Harvard Medical School will give you the secondary application there. And on the secondary application, you want to select Pathways, HST, and the MD-PhD program. Again, there's no disincentive to applying to all three. So you can put your, your hat in the ring for all of them. Or if you know in your heart that one program is calling to you more than the others, you can certainly choose that as well. It's really, it's truly up to you. Um, this part of the process contributes to over 600 applications that the MD PhD program sees. In line with the national trends this year, we did see a significant increase in application numbers. Um, after all these applications are screened and reviewed, we issue interview invitations, and our program typically interviews between 75 and 85 people each cycle, and all of this leads to about 12 to 14 admitted MSTP students per year, and MSTP is the shorthand for the grant that funds our program. If you have any questions about anything that I just chatted about, please don't hesitate to reach out. That's our email address right there. We also are starting to host monthly virtual program information sessions, which is something that uh, we're really excited about to kind of get to connect more with interested applicants. These events will cover some of what we talked about today, but also um, provide a chance to meet some program staff, answer any questions that you may have. And if you are interested in attending that, um, there's a link down here and you can just, it's a very short registration um, and then you can come join us later on. I also have some links that I can put in the chat here in the event that you're interested in exploring more a little independently. I know that um, Christopher did mention the Four Directions Summer Research Program and I also have a few other resources um, that you might wanna independently explore that'll help you. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for giving me this time to chat with you all. And I'm going to stop sharing now and pass it back to you, Jack. Great. Um, and I have a quick question for those um, virtual monthly. Do you have to be an undergrad or an, um, a graduate student or anything like this or a requirement for joining? No, nope. if you're interested, we're happy to, to talk to you. So I'm happy to, sh to share that link. 
Great. There was a question about the resources that were available for like the students who have graduated for a while and um, or those the gap years. So that might be a really good resource for students who are trying to navigate the conversation of going back to school. Would you agree? Okay. Yes. There is a space in the registration form for you to indicate kind of some of what your questions might be. And that's a good way for us to make sure that we're able to address you in, in the most proper format. Great. And so if, um, oh, as we go to Deanna, you know, if um, AT um, Stills has that same type of like resource, like if you could let the students know about what that looks like for students who are returning after maybe a break from, from school. I know that in some instances, I, you know, and this is something too, when we think about the program prerequisites, and um, I don't know if it was mentioned um, specifically, but like if you could share like maybe how to get students to be prepared for that medical or that application, like if there's an internship or something that's sort of like, I, you know, I won't say competitive edge because I think sometimes it's required, you know, before you move into the next iteration of, of for medical school. So I'll stop there. And um, thank you, Haley and Christopher. Now we'll go to Deanna. Maybe. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. My name is Deanna Hughes. I am the Director of Admissions for AT Still University. I am located in Mesa, Arizona, and I do have Angie on the call with us as well today. So we're going to um, share this together. Um, but first, and I want to share my screen um, briefly just to cover what AT Still is all about, um, as you may not have ever heard of us. So this is something that, um, you know, we want to introduce ourselves first. Can you see my screen where it says AT Still? Okay, um, just a little background about AT Still University. We are named after Andrew Taylor Still. So Andrew Taylor Still is the founding father of osteopathic medicine and he started the very first DO school um, in Kirksville, Missouri. So our sister campus is in Kirksville. Um, I am at the Mesa, Arizona campus. So we're kind of uh, sister campuses basically. But these are all of our schools that are under one university. So under one name, AT Still, we have all of these schools the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine on our Kirksville campus, the School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona um, here. So we call that SOMA. The Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health. We are the very first dental school in Arizona, and we call that ASDO. And we also have the Missouri School of Dentistry and Oral Health, which is MOSDO. Um, and then we have the Arizona School of Health Sciences. And under that school, we have our allied health programs, such as our physician assistant program, which Angie will go into more detail in a minute, um, our physical therapy program, our occupational therapy program, and our audiology program. Um, so those are the programs here on our campus that are under Arizona School of Health Sciences. College of Graduate Health Sci Studies is an all online school that's basically for post-professional. So it wouldn't really um, pertain to to you yet because you would already have to be a PA or PT or an OT to be able to take courses in our, our online. Um, College for Healthy Communities is our brand new location in Santa Maria, California. We're starting a new PA cohort in Santa Maria this fall. So that's really exciting. We're uh, it's going to be a 90 seat cohort for physician assistant in Santa Maria, California. So we're excited to start that and we're hoping to have more programs offered in Santa Maria soon um, in that area. And I do want to say, I apologize, I didn't have Doherty on the call, but um, he was invited to this. So Doherty Beauty is our National Center for American Indian Health Professions Advisor and Director. Um, so what I'm going to do is share the link in the chat to the center webpage. That way you all can go there and find out the services that we offer if that's okay with you. Um, let's see if I can do that. You know what, do I have to get off screen to do that? Or can I just do it in the chat? Um, I can actually find it and in, in, um, insert it in there for you, Deanna. Okay. Um, so it's just atsu.edu slash American slash Indian. Um, and that's the name of our center. And so, like I said, we have a director um, who is um, and here's an exciting opportunity for you. If you were looking into getting a pre-admissions workshop, they are holding one the week of May 13th and 14th. And there is a sign up for that on our website. Um, you can get a lot of um, sessions being um, in this PAW, we call it PAW, pre-admissions workshop. And it's specifically for American Indian 
um, students interested in any of the health professions. So we have competitive application workshop. We have how to write a personal essay workshop. We have how to study for your MCAT and DAT workshop. And so this is um, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So if you are interested, please do go to our events page on our website. And I'm happy to share this when I stop sharing my screen. I can go ahead and send that link and also give you Doherty's contact information um, because he would love for uh, you to contact him and he can explain more about that to you. So if we go back to the um, PowerPoint here, I just want to briefly touch on our mission statement. We serve as a learning center university dedicated to preparing highly competent professionals through innovative academic programs. Our commitment to osteopathic heritage, which means it's the focus on whole person care healthcare. We are not teaching osteopathic manipulative medicine in our PA programs or in our dental programs or PT programs even, uh, but we are committed to the philosophy of osteopathic medicine, which is basically treating the patient as a whole person and not just the disease itself, but seeing that patient, uh, you know, basically getting to know that patient in their their uh, commitment to the com community, what kind of nutrition are they committed to? What kind of um, exercise are they committed to? So we, we treat that person as a community member um, and not just the disease itself. So we're committed to that. And we also have a mission to serve underserved populations. And you will see that in our admissions requirements and also in our rotations, we send our students out into medically underserved communities um, to do their clinical rotations pretty much in all of our programs. Um, you'll hear more about it in Angie's, um, in Angie's presentation. So the Arizona School of Health Sciences, this is what our building looks like here at Mesa. Um, and so it is a it's a interprofessional building. So again, you, those are the programs that you will see. We don't have any undergraduates on our campus. It's all graduate programs. I was asked today to speak directly on PT and dental. Um, so I wasn't going to touch much on the medical because uh, you had a great medical presentation already. And I would say ditto to everything that Christopher has already said, he, um, basically everything about the application, how to be strong applicant, the primary, the secondary, as he did mention, a comus would be our, uh, you know, central application service outside of the MD program. So other than that, um, yeah, the medical school, if you're interested, I can definitely go more into it, but I was told you you were more interested in PT, PA, and dental today. So those are the programs that we have to discuss here. So the PT program, um, this is basically a, a mix of, oh, sorry about that, if you can see that. So the integrated curriculum, which means it is a mix of basic science and didactic um, coursework. You will be on campus for your clinical rotations um, you will be off campus some weeks and you will be on campus for your didactic and we say didactic we mean like your lecture in class learning experiences it is a 36 month program 24 months didactic in person lecture 12 12 months will be your uh, rotations off campus um, we the farthest location off campus would be about an hour away so they're all local if you don't know where mesa arizona is we're pretty much in the phoenix area um, so being that we will uh, you know, we're about 20 minutes from Phoenix, 20, 25 minutes. We are proud of our 100% placement rate. And uh, we, so we have had that consistently for the um, entire program. And we've been here in Mesa for since 1995. Um, so we have had this program in, in Arizona that long. These are some of the locations, the postgraduate placement that you can see that we have our students at. Um, we, so th this is just a sampling of some of our placement um, locations, NFL, University of Virginia, Duke, Olympic Training Center, Scripps, John Hopkins, Shriners, Mayo Clinic. If you look at the competitive application, um, if you are normally for in person, we're sharing our flyers with you. We're sharing an, an information. Um, let me go ahead and get you to Angie real quick though. I'm sorry, Angie, I just now saw your message um, because I'm going to let her discuss her PA before she has to jump off and then we'll come back. So go ahead and um, let me get 
jump in there. So, so my name is Angie Kaselik. I am a um, been a PA for 16 years in family practice. Absolutely love my job. I'm also faculty full time in the didactic portion of the PA program, which is two years. And I actually am going to be proctoring our clinical students in virtual ground grand rounds here in a few minutes, which is why I'm going to boot off. But um, if any of you are out there considering being a PA, uh, US News and World Report just uh, reported the PA profession as being the number one in the country. And so we're expecting a lot of applications from everyone this year. Um, and we do have a PowerPoint that has all the prereqs and of course our website. But the biggest thing about our program is um, we really emphasize the volunteer, the patient care experience. Um, our, our programs in Mesa is 70 students. That's where I'm teaching two years long. And our first year students have been working, um, doing children, well child checks in a Title I um, local elementary school. On the weekends, we've been doing um, pod, COVID vaccine pods, and that's all our first year students. And then all our second year students, um, both the Santa Maria campus in California, which is our new PA program, and then the one in Mesa, we send all our students out to community health centers. Um, and this has been such a fantastic experience. Oftentimes they're getting job offers before they even graduate. Um, so our, they love our students. Our students are getting experiences. They're out in the community. And if you haven't, um, if you're not super familiar with the PA program, uh, it started, it has a very military roots. It started Navy's, Navy Corpsmen, the first class were, were three people. Um, and it has grown since then. And so primary care is usually what PAs are getting into. Um, but there's so many different specialties. We have students doing psychiatry, cardiothoracic surgery, um, telehealth medicine, all, all different areas. And so I'm going to let Deanna just kind of forward through. Um, and then hopefully we can share this uh, website with you as well. But we are looking for students when we do our admissions process. We're looking for students who have that volunteer experience in the healthcare community, uh, patient experience in the healthcare community. And we, we also have students who um, are called hometown scholars. And it's an automatic interview into our program if you are endorsed by one of our community health center partners. Um, and you can learn more about that. Again, Deanna is going to share information with you. And then we have a pipeline to practice program where we, we partner with certain universities and also giving automatic interviews within our program. We're really trying to promote people who want to practice in their community, in their rural and underserved community. Um, and again, it's a, it's a two-year program. Um, PAs do have to have supervising physicians and oftentimes partner with MDs, DOs. Okay, go, and you can see our, on the screen, you can see our community partners as well. Um, and you can fast forward, there's a couple of slides I wanna get to before I'm going to jump off and go hang out with the students. There's a, you know, just information more about the, the PA profession itself. Um, so we are authorized to practice in the United States more. We're getting more people who are, um, England, Scotland are very PA friendly countries. And more and more we have PAs volunteering in international locations as well. Yes, so we can definitely share the slide deck with the attendees as well. And then you can see, um, the PA, I'm going to jump ahead, you can see the scope of practice um, as far as assisting in surgeries. Um, and PAs will off, sometimes run their own practice, but they do, again, have to have a supervising physician. And so they will offer, oftentimes be working in a team with MDs, nurse practitioners, DOs. Um, sometimes you'll see naturopathics as well, PTs, all different, uh, different types of health professions. Um, and then you can skip, you can keep skipping, just data stuff, information. You can see the salary there. You can see um, PAs are licensed through individual states. And depending on what state you practice, all the license um, are, are a little bit different. And then you can see the, the next slide is, is showing you about the US News and World Report. So it, it, it's, a, it's been just a, a really great profession because of the, um, 
being able to be flexible and you could start off in family practice, go into ER, decide you want to go into psychiatry. So that's very appealing to people, as well as having a really nice work-life balance. Um, I take call on a team, uh, but I don't work on the weekends as a family practice PA. I work in a primarily Hispanic community, and I have so many opportunities to volunteer um, constantly, and it's all been just a very job satisfaction uh, being a PA. And so Deanna, I am going to have to to boot <laughs> to get to my students. So um, we are definitely going to share the slide with you, and she can answer any other questions as well. Um, and please feel free, I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, email in the chat as well, and please feel free to write, reach out to me. Thank you, Jack, for inviting us so much. And let me do the chat and I am out of here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, appreciate you and being able to be here and answer those questions real quickly. Um, and again, we will share that uh, PowerPoint with you and I appreciate you Perfect. being here, Andrew, for sure. Perfect. <laughs> um, also real briefly, like I mentioned, if we were uh, in person, we would be sharing with you our flyers that we would give out. And these flyers have more information on them, such as our prerequisites. And so if we were going to look at um, our, oh, sorry about that, let me go back. If we were going to look at dental, for example, doctor of dental medicine, can you all see that flyer? This has our prerequisites on there. Um, you have to have Gen Bio for one year. That means Gen 1, Gen Bio 1, Gen Bio 2. Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, these all include labs, Organic Chemistry 1, Organic Chemistry 2, Physics 1, Physics 2, Human Anatomy 1, Human Anatomy um, or, and Human Physiology, or you can take A&P Combined 1 and A&P Combined 2. Um, biochemistry, which has to be an upper division course, and then the English 101 and 102, typically. Um, so that is like just the prerequisites to take within our dental program. Uh, similarly, I can also share a flyer for our PT program and the prerequisites if you are interested in that. Or if you'd like, Jack, I can actually send out some physical flyers to you. I'd be happy to mail those and you can distribute those to everybody in your group so that they can have physical flyers. I'd be happy to do that for PT, dental, PA, um, all of our programs that you think there would be some interest in. Um, these are some of the stats from our entering class that just started last summer. Uh, so we had about 2,400 applications received for the dental class of 78 and about 332 were interviewed. So again, you can see that it is very competitive to get into dental school. Um, you, do, you don't have to be necessarily a science major. You can major in anything. Um, so we basically say, as long as you're taking your prerequisites within your undergrad, you are qualified to, to apply to any of our programs. You don't have to have a physiology degree or a biology degree. Um, these are just the average stats for our class that just start, that just matriculated in, in 2020. Um, so we, you can see that the um, the GPA minimum is quite low for for dental schools. We're one of the lowest actually. 2.5 is the minimum. Um, I would say best to have over 3.0 just to be, at, you know, a, a good candidate. But not to say that those under 3.0 have not gotten in because they have. That's why we have the minimum set where we do. Um, but it is competitive. You're up against a lot of other people and they're looking at a lot of different things. Um, so to be a competitive applicant for ET Still University as a whole, um, they look at GPA, they look at your, your, your entrance exam, whether it be your DAT for dental, your GRE for PT, or your MCAT for DO. Those are all very important. Um, but then in, equally important are the things like, are you a good match to our mission? Do you have a desire to serve the underserved? Do you have at least 200 broad-based community service, non-medical, non-dental community service hours? So we're looking for that to be a good competitive applicant to our school. Um, so also we're looking at, did you shadow a PT or a dentist or a DO or a PA? Those are very important. You want to see how they practice in their scope of practice. So you want shadowing hours outside of clinical hands-on. So you get your clinical hands-on ex experiences and then you have your shadowing. We count those separately. 
Um, you also will have um, your, you know, club involvement, leadership. Did, were you involved in, um, you know, some philanthropy through a fraternity or a sorority? Did you do some service opportunity through a uh, athletic club or a religious organization? Those are all very important to us to know. So these are things you're going to include on your primary application. Um, so. I want to give enough time to your next speaker, and I know that uh, we kind of brushed through some of our programs, but I'm happy to share the flyers with you, Jack, if you like. I can physically mail those. That sounds good. Um, I did have a question from one student. She was wondering if there was any support for um, <clears throat> uh, um, dentistry certification. Now, does that come after you do school? Okay, and then so yes, like, what yes. does that look like? I know that's like kind of like, you know, I'm taking the bar kind of a question, like, you know, I'm yeah. getting way ahead of myself, but I'm, I thought we would throw that in there. Absolutely. So in your curriculum, you are getting your prep for your step one and your step two and your boards and all of those um, tests you have to take to become a certified physician or PA or dentist. So all of those uh, exams come after you will pass the, the course. So the DMD, for example, it's a four year program. It's a four year degree. Um, you will be taking the board exams within your curriculum. You will be getting your support within the curriculum. Absolutely, there's, there's board prep. Um, and there are some special um, courses that they have outlined. They have also purchased some Kaplan um, pre prep for our students as well, whether it's in the DO program. Um, so there is a lot of um, support. There's also um, some testing support on campus. We have PAL tutoring, which is peer assisted learning. And we also have a test, um, testing center with some support there. We have our counselors on staff as well. Um, so there is a lot of student support in, as well as um, mental health of students. We take that very seriously as well. So we have a lot of mental health um, support and we we still do have Doherty. Um, he is with some students all the way through to graduation. So even if they are, you know, he's helping them get in through admissions, but he's also supporting them in um, being in their uh, Native American clubs on campus and um, a lot of support there as well. Um, Sam, I'm going to be specific to you right now because your question. I think that um, the way that the testing works, and it probably um, just what um, Deanna shared is that the programs are built to be supportive to your certification over time. So you have to go through a dentistry program before you can actually do certification. And through AT still, it sounds like they work with you to fulfill all your certifications as you go along to get to the final exam. Is that sort of the, the way and I think that's sort of and I'm going to say this and anybody can you know um, add to that however they think but I think all of the schools work to include support for ensuring that you pass whatever exam it is that you need to pass to be a professional certified professional because I know that if you're investing in the school they like to invest in you to ensure that they can say like where their students are going and how successful their students are so I'm going to just leave that there for now. So right to clarify, the DAT is to get in. So we don't we don't have any kind of prep on campus for that, but we do as part of our PAW workshop. So if you are interested in that pre-admissions workshop for American Indian students, we do have um, some workshops on how to prepare for the DAT, but that's really the extent of it. More of that is on your undergrad institution. So you might want to check with your undergrad institution on what kind of support they have for entrance exams, such as the DAT, the MCAT, the GRE. We don't provide those kinds of supports on this campus. We do, like Jack said, the, the boards, your, your prep for certification. Great, thank you. Um, all right, and I'll look into the um, chat box to see what other questions emerge. So Danielle, if you want to take it away. All right, great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Great. Poso ane mao ni miak mshikne tanawe makana. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Danielle Yancey. I come from the Menominee and Santee Dakota Sioux people, and I'm Bear Clan. I grew up on the Menominee Indian Reservation here in North Central Wisconsin. So a wawanin and thank you to Jack for inviting us to share some information about the work that we do at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Native American Center for Health Professions, which I'll call NACHIP for short. Um, so my role is serving as our center's director. I also wanted to just take a quick moment to um, acknowledge that I'm joining you all here from Dejop, which is on the ancestral homelands of the Ho-Chunk Nation and what is now known as Madison, Wisconsin, where our university now sits. Uh, so for today's, um, the information that I wanna to share today will uh, focus on what we have to offer here at the School of Medicine and Public Health and our center and some tips about applying to medical school. And a big thank you to my colleagues who have already covered a lot of great information. So I'll, so I'll try not to be redundant, um, but a little bit about our School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, one of the unique features about our university is that we are uh, the only School of Medicine and Public Health in the US. Um, our school has a big focus on health promotion and disease prevention. Um, we also recently went through a major uh, curriculum transformation to integrate more public health skills into our four-year medical school training and infusing that into the traditional medical school training model. Um, a little bit about our center's history and background. So we've, um, we are located within the School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, NACHIP has been around since 2012, and we were founded by Dr. Eric Brout, who's an Ojibwe uh, family medicine physician who's now over at Oregon Health Sciences University. Uh, but he was our, our trailblazer and champion to get a center like this established in Wisconsin, um, in particularly to address the fact that Native Americans are significantly underrepresented in the health professions. And Wisconsin being home to 12 Native nations seemed like a great place to make an investment in a program like this here in our state. Our center is also one of the recipients of the Indians into Medicine grant. Um, we were renewed in 2019, which has um, a dedicated focus on increasing um, the representation of American Indians in, in medicine. Um, in addition, our center is interprofessional, so we work with um, all of our UW Health Professions programs. I'll be focusing primarily on the MD program, but we do also work with um, physician assistant, physical therapy, public health, genetics counseling, nursing, pharmacy, social work, and veterinary medicine. So if students have interest in any of those post back programs, um, we'd be happy to talk with you more about that. So a little bit about our center's missions aim. Um, so like I mentioned, increasing recruitment, retention, and graduation of students. We also have a commitment to enriching and improving our students' experiences while they're in training programs um, because it can be a very rigorous and sometimes stressful, maybe a lot of times stressful <laughs> training experience. And so we're really committed to creating a, a community and a nurturing environment for our students so they can not only survive, but also thrive while they're in their programs. Um, we also have been doing a lot of work to integrate Native American specific curriculum into our training programs um, and also working to recruit and retain Native American faculty. And then lastly, our center also has a commitment to working um, and enhancing our tribal academic partnerships. So we do work in partnership with a lot of our tribal communities here in Wisconsin. And this is our NACHIP team. Um, a lot of us are graduates of UW-Madison, so we often draw upon our experience of being students here. Um, we also have Dr. Brett Benali thompson who is our principal investigator on our InMed grant. He's a faculty physician here at SMPH in palliative care. I also wanted to briefly highlight um, a lot of our work is driven um, by the need for more American Indians and Alaska Natives in medicine. And I just wanted to briefly highlight this um, really important publication that came out in 2018 that was published in partnership with the AAMC and the Association of American Indian Physicians, just demonstrating why uh, this kind of work is so important. Um, and a big thank you to Jack and his team for organizing today's event because we do need more American Indians and Alaskan Natives in the fields of medicine. And this um, snapshot just shows you 
how much work we have yet to do. The number of American Indians and Alaska Natives going into, uh, into medicine over the past several years has been declining. Um, and you look at the number of active physicians and full-time faculty is extremely low. Uh, but when you look at um, our student population, their commitment to service in underserved areas is so much higher in comparison to their counterparts or their peers. And so again, just speaks to the importance and need for supporting students that want to go into medicine. So I applaud all the students who are on the call today, getting this information and seeking out these resources. So a little bit about our programs at SMPH. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, our forward curriculum, we just transformed a few years ago and our four-year model is now broken up into three phases. And really the intent behind that is to get students into um, clinical experiences much earlier on in their training experience. And then here are a few other programs that I'll briefly highlight. Um, the first is a training in urban medicine and public health. So we do have a specialized track that students can apply for during their first year of medical school if they have a specific interest in urban um, populations. Here in Wisconsin, our largest Native American population is actually in Milwaukee. So we have um, supported our students who have had an interest in doing that work and in getting involved in the local Native American community as part of their training, um, which has been really great. We also have a path of distinction in public health. So for students that have a strong interest in public health but may not want to do a dual degree, uh, we do have a four-year longitudinal pathway for students that can still integrate this into their training experience. They take an additional eight electives over the four years. They uh, have a project mentor and do a field experience. And we have about 50 to 60 students that participate in this program. Uh, we also have a similar pathway for research uh, specifically. We have, um, it's a minimum of 16 weeks of mentored research. Um, students submit a research thesis and publication and present their research findings. We also have uh, dual degree programs, like many of my colleagues have also shared. We have the MD-MPH, which is a 12-month program done concurrently with the MD program. When students are completing their secondary application, you can indicate that on your application, so it doesn't require a separate application process. Um, we also have our MD-PhD program, which we, uh, for short, called MSTP. Uh, this program is approximately eight years in length. Um, and one of the things I would like to highlight about our P, uh, PhD program is that it is NIH funded, so students that do apply and are accepted um, get uh, full tuition and expenses covered. And we recently created a Badger bonus program to offer students an additional stipend to help cover their expenses. And then we also have another specialized track. A big part of our school's mission is um, you know, addressing health inequities and serving underserved communities. So we have a, a new program called WARM, Wisconsin Academy for Rural Medicine. And this is for students who will actually go outside of the Madison area after their first year and will complete the majority of their training in rural communities in Wisconsin. Um, students from Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are eligible to apply for this program. And again, this is something that students would indicate on their secondary application. Um, so it wouldn't require a separate application process. And then a little bit about our center and the opportunities and support that we offer to students at Wisconsin. Um, it's really important for us to create spaces and opportunities for students to stay culturally connected and grounded while they're in their training program. So we offer a number of opportunities to support that. We also have a number of tribal clinical rotations for students that they're able to do as part of their rotations. We have a tribal engagement office that's um, housed in partnership with the Oneida Nation at their Oneida Community Health Center that helps to facilitate those placements for students. We also recently launched an American Indian Health Elective, um, which is kind of a precursor for students prior to doing tribal clinical rotations. Um, and gives an opportunity to learn about uh, health history and tribal governance. Um, we also help facilitate a number of tribal community-based learning opportunities and research, as well as professional development opportunities. So a lot of these are supported by our InMed grant. Um, so if you're looking to medical school and particularly interested in SMPH, here's a snapshot of our prerequisites. Um, so the entering class of 2021, here are some of the science requirements um, that they will need to fulfill for admission. 
Our minimum metrics for the MCAT is a 500 and our minimum GPA is a 3.0. And I would just uh, advise students to be mindful of what is your overall GPA and what is your science GPA. So you'll wanna make sure that you are hitting that for both. Um, for the MD application process, um, many have already touched upon MCAS, which is going to be your primary general application. In addition to that, you'll need to start organizing your letters of recommendation. Um, here at Wisconsin, you're required to have three academic letters from faculty and then a fourth letter from a mentor. So as you're getting to the point of looking at specific medical schools, these requirements may vary. So um, I know we all have websites where you can get into the details of that. And then of course, beginning to work on your personal statement. Um, this is really a, a great showpiece in your application where you're able to talk about yourself beyond your experiences. It's a space for you to tell your story and why you're interested in medicine. And I always encourage students to to do their personal statement in a way that goes beyond saying that you're really interested in medicine and want to help people. So how do you really, you know, stand out and highlight the assets that you would bring um, to the field of medicine to the school that you're applying to. Um, I did want to touch upon a couple of things in regards to our school's secondary application. Um, students will receive an automatic invitation to complete the secondary if you meet our minimum metrics and prerequisites. Um, so you will receive that. Um, you will need to do a supplemental essay. This is a great opportunity to say why this medical school. So this is going to be an additional essay separate from the one that you did for AMCAS. Um, this year, we will continue to include a COVID-19 additional essay question. So this is an opportunity to say or express how the pandemic has impacted you, um, particularly if you've had uh, health experiences lined up or you had some unique experiences that may have impacted your preparation process. Um, this is an opportunity to share those things with the committee. Um, I also wanted to note that our secondary application deadline is December 1st. I always encourage students to complete their secondary school uh, because our school does do rolling admissions. Um, so once students complete their applications, we'll begin inviting students to interviews and students will be getting um, acceptances toward the later part of the year. So you, you don't wanna wait to complete that um, as part of the process. So it's really important to know those deadlines and kind of timing for any medical school that you're applying to. Um, and then I also wanted to note that our interview process this year will again be virtual. Um, if you're invited to uh, do an interview, you could anticipate doing a faculty interview and a student group interview, and then we'll have a host in medical school informational session. So this is a great opportunity to hear from current students, faculty, school leadership about our school admission. So a little bit of stats from our 2020 entering class. Um, we admit 176 students each year. Um, this is typically from about 294 accepts that we made last year. 136 of our students were Wisconsin residents and 40 non-residents. We had 10 students um, admitted into our PhD program, 26 into WARM, 43% uh, attended UW-Madison, and then the age range of our incoming class was 21 to 44. So I know there were some questions about non-traditional students. So you're definitely not alone in you know, coming to school, not directly out of, of college or undergrad. Um, some more kind of snapshots of our last class. The top three majors are biology, biochemistry, and neuroscience. Here are some of the other majors that students entered in with 33% um, of our incoming class last year were underrepresented groups in medicine and 13% had advanced degrees. I would like to say that there, there is no uh, specific major that you need to apply to medical school. I mean, you could really major in anything so long as you're meeting those prerequisites um, for medical school. So a little bit about financial aid. Um, our school does offer admission scholarships and we do have additional school scholarships for current students. 
Our center also has some scholarships for current students who are enrolled that they can apply for. And then I also wanted to highlight um, the Indian Health Service and National Health Service Corps scholarships. These are opportunities for students to be able to get loan repayment, um, particularly if they have an interest in working with uh, Indian Health Service uh, clinics or in underserved rural communities. Um, so this is a great way to help offset some of the med school expenses. So a little bit about planning ahead. I, I won't spend too much time here because there was some really great advice already shared with you, but planning ahead is a great idea. Getting yourself organized is great. Uh, find a system for you to just start recording all of your experiences and who did you work with? What's their contact information and how many hours did you do? Those are some really great uh, details to keep track of because trying to do them all at once might feel a little overwhelming. Um, I also encourage you to use the resources that are available to you. You know, uh, those who shared their email addresses with you today, I'll share mine. Keep those connections because, you know, we're all here to help you. Um, you also want to start reaching out to your letter writers early. Um, you want to make those asks early and ask people who are going to give you a strong uh, letter of recommendation. And then of course, um, having, having a plan, your timeline. Um, and here are just some examples of activities and experiences that you can do, that you can include in your application. Again, I just wanna also highlight that you bring assets with you, your community involvement, your family involvement, um, things that you have done that are really important to you and have a tie with medicine, health, well-being, community service, you know, those are all great, including your experiences. Um, some additional resources and things to get involved with. I know there was some mention of the PAW that's offered in the Four Corners. We also do an applicant workshop in the Great Lakes. I believe there's also um, applicant workshops in the Northeast and the Northwest and the Association of American Indian Physicians also does an applicant workshop. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for those. There are also po post back programs. So if you need some GPA recovery or maybe you need to do hit some of those prerequisites, um, I encourage you to, you know, explore a post back program option. Um, Dr. Bro, who is our founding director, is now the director of NACO and has created the YES post back program, which is great for students that um, need that additional year. And then again, getting some advising and coaching and take advantage of the pre health and pre med opportunities. I saw Shapap mentioned earlier on a slide. That's a great program. Um, AHEC programs all across the country also have great opportunities. Um, I also wanted to share that our center will be launching uh, a new podcast this summer called Medicine Talkers, which will be um, a, a great way to get information out to students who are on a path to medicine and health, a, a way for us to share education and information. Um, so look for us in Spotify later this summer. I also wanted to share just some uh, resources uh, like AAIP has some great resources. There's an Association of Native American Medical Students. ACES through their national conference each year um, has a track for health focused opportunities. And then the AAMC is a great resource for med school prep. And then lastly, here's some uh, resources and links to get connected to NACHIP um, and to our MD admission site. Here's our website. I also encourage students to check out We Are Healers. This is um, a great program that was started under our first in-med grant by Dr. Brot. Um, you can see videos and stories of Native health professionals in various careers sharing their stories. Um, the first link features uh, health professionals from the Great Lakes region, and this is now a national organization um, that has uh, different individuals sharing their stories and their pathway into health. And then social media is always a great way to stay connected and get information. Um, so I can share this with Jack afterwards, so you can uh, share that along with students. Here's my contact information if you have any questions. So go on in and thank you. Great, awesome. You know, I have, you know, people ask about that, um, that support for students who have the GPA question, and I have not thought of post back as a solution for that. So that's something to really sort of consider, and I'll keep that in mind because I know that we have a lot of students that we work with in our in our um, in some of our cohorts that are looking to sort of think about like how do they uh, prepare for, you know, um, 
an application with they have like a, a, a background of um, needing that extra support. That's awesome. That's something that I just learned today, which I'm really thankful for. So much great information. Thank all of you for like the things that you've brought forward for um, a number of reasons for me. Um, Deanna, there was one more question from um, a student. Um, what is the rate of acceptance for DAT score of 16? And would you recommend that DAT be retaken? Um, I would because our minimum preferred is 70 for the academic average. That's just our school. Um, so if you are, you know, of course, reaching out to all different schools, they might have different answers. But for our school, the preferred minimum would be a 17 for academic average. And they really don't look at the breakdown so much as that academic average. So I would probably recommend a retake. Great. Thank you. Then there was also the question of um, uh, like returning, and I know that this is always a, um, a an interesting question for me. So, if a student, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask it in two ways, but I'm gonna say it pretty blunt. Do you think that there's a, a matriculation pathway that has to happen to be successful to get into grad school or into medical school? I mean, do you does it matter that you've not taken courses like right from undergrad into med school or pre med or you know, is there, is it more challenging if someone decides that, hey, I'm going to go work for a thousand years and come back and then decide I'm going to be, you know, go into a medical program? You know, is there some sort of advice that you could give to that? Or is there, or, you know, I know that, you know, for, for lawyers, it was, no, if you want to be a lawyer, then you can just start because there's, I mean, there's no real, like, there's no real reason or need, you know, your work experience probably is going to be helpful more so than not, but that's kind of like all they really said. But I wondered if that was different for medical school or medical-based programs. Thoughts? I guess that it's pretty much the same answer. <laughs> if you want to go to school, do it, <laughs> and then we're here to be helpful. Again, um, Danielle, you're Yeah, I, I would I mean, that's such a, a tough question because I feel like it's such a personal question as well, you know, depending upon where a person may be at in their pathway or journey, because I've worked with students who have made the leap into medical school right after undergrad. So they were actually going through the application process while they were still in undergrad. And I know there was a question earlier about um, preparing for MCAT. And I would just tell students, if you're planning to do that, you might want to think about what your course load will look like at the time that you're planning to study for the MCAT and take it so that you're not overwhelming yourself um, because you don't want your grades to suffer because you're focusing on MCAT, which will also be a part of your application process. So you'll want to think about the nuance of your timing and, and how you would want to do that. Um, on the other end, I have worked with individuals who, you know, worked in a career, you know, another career before they decided to go into medicine or took time off. And I would just encourage um, them to, you know, as you're studying for MCAT, it's also a great time to do a refresher on those sciences <laughs> that you maybe haven't touched for a while and just kind of getting back into student mode. Um, so I've seen individuals be successful in, in both of those areas. And then I would just add for um, those who may be non-traditional and coming to medical school a little later in life, we do have a number of student organizations and programs for, for those who are on a different pathway, especially if they may have families or have young children. So, I mean, there's ways to find community, um, you know, given your, your unique experience and path too. Awesome, great, thank you for that. Um, you know, the thing that I think is pretty um, helpful too is to remember, you know, I just had IHS present on their scholarships and I didn't know how much resource that they actually have in reference to prep and support during your um, program years. And so I would definitely look at that. I put an IHS scholarship link in there, but look at their programs and then reach out to their um, regional offices because some of the regions have specific relationships with um, schools and they help you get into those schools that are kind of associated with their, with their programming. And then some of them are related and linked to tribes and some of the tribes have special sort of relationships with, with the way that they um, operationalize some of their dollars and support. So, I mean, there's, there's some really 
um, useful um, pieces to that to consider. And then also, and I, I don't know, although I can't remember, I can't recall all of the resources they have available, but they do have a lot in reference to prep stuff. And I know that that's some of the deal. And I would also look at that um, Association of American Indian Physicians uh, prep program. That is really helpful. And I mean, I think, you know, thank you, Danielle, for mentioning a few others, because in med, I think that they have programs usually at all their schools to help students sort of get in there. And I think that's also like a pre-med um, um, assistance programming as well. Is that true, Danielle, or am I just making things up? Uh, yeah, AAIP, I know, does a lot to um, support students who are intending to pursue a career in medicine. They have a great website where they're posting different events and opportunities. Um, they also have an annual national conference, which will be virtual this year. It's coming up at the end of July. Um, so I, I've met a lot of undergrad students who have gone to that program um, each year, and that's a great space to get you know, more information about opportunities, tips on applying to medical school. Um, and it's also a great way for students to get engaged with the Association of Native American Medical Students, which is ANAMS. And I think just finding uh, a community of support is, is huge. And that's a great avenue to find that. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to reiterate ACES, the American Indian Society, um, Science and Engineering Society. All of these schools go there and to some, you know, to some degree, and they're out there looking for students and trying to, you know, build that access point. So, you know, um, that's a great resource to find, you know, inlets to have conversations with people who could be helpful. Um, and I also do want to point out that <clears throat> sometimes it's difficult to understand if people can be helpful who are non-native, but there are a lot of non-natives who are in admissions at all of these schools. And I'm going to let you know that they are help, they're there to help. And it's just, you know, just sort of being patient with them as well as them being patient with you to figure out, like, I need to figure out, like, how to be helpful. And, and it's, these are great. The way that you've asked questions today and the way that you're thinking, pretty straightforward and pretty helpful. And I mean, if you can consistently think about, like, what does this look like as you advance forward and sort of, like, planning out the career, the next step, like, keep your questions pretty straightforward and simple. And then people can sort of know a little bit more about, like, oh, then I can refer you to this or to that. Um, so that's also another piece um, I think that's super important because I know that, you know, when we're talking to the law school people, they're like, if you're going to get into our school, we're going to make sure that you get a really good job. So like, we're working with you and we want to be there to be supportive. So I know that all these schools are diligently trying to figure out like how to be um, more accessible in whatever term that means. Something I like about AT stills is that they're working, or AT still is that they're working to sort of promote urban and uh, rural health. And what does that look like? And I know that the programs that are native focused are doing some of that type of work as well. You know, so just sort of thinking about where do I want to show up in the long term is a part of that planning process to say, like, I want to be a person who is working in a community that is in the middle of, you know, nowhere in Arizona. You know, so just trying to figure out like how to navigate and propose the idea to see if people you know, can be useful to that. Like Haley said, if you don't see a program here that we don't have, like just talk to us about it. And then maybe we can sort of pinpoint a place where you can show up and we can be supportive to what it is that you ultimately want. Because I think that everyone is at that stage when it gets, when you get to this part of the education, because it's not undergrad. Graduate degree programming and sort of stepping into this, into a specific professional field, like you are making a concerted effort to say like, I am committing myself to this endeavor and I really want to support the world in this way. And I'm hoping that you can help me. So it's not like we're, you're, um, it's not an expectation. It's just sort of like a thing, a, a variable that graduate school and medical school, law school, all of these things are like a commitment and you should be solid in sort of understanding what that commitment looks like enough so that people are not here to sort of like handhold in a way that's sort of like, um, I guess sort of hindrance, a hindrance, you know, because the thing is, is that they're there to be supportive, but at the same time, they're not there to coax you through the experience, you know? So just trying to navigate what that feels like and what that looks like, because the commitment of service is very strong in Native people. And, you know, so we don't need to urge you to take that on, but now they're giving it good solid language. And like, I want to be a doctor who works in this sort of 
you know, environment with these people. And then, you know, adding some other layers to that is pretty, you know, phenomenal. I had a student once and she was a, in a, a, a nursing program. Then she went into a physician's assistant program. And then she, um, and, and while she was doing that, she became an EMT and, um, and then got an MBA. And I was, I was like, why are you doing all of these things? She's like, well, because I'm from the middle of nowhere in New Mexico and I wanna have an ambulance company where I can train people how to like be useful to keeping people alive until we get, can get them to the hospital, which is two and a half hours away. And I was just like, wow, okay, that all makes sense to me. So then, you know, like how do we help and support you to be better at this and find people and do the thing. So it's like, she had a sort of an idea that sort of like was centralized in a variety of different ways and trying to figure out like, how do we have conversations that can sort of lend to some of that as we move forward with you and your program? Well, um, I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna, um, any last comments before we wrap up? I know we're three minutes over, but I just want to give everybody a, a chance to close out as uh, presenters. Uh, this is Danielle. I just want to give a shout out to the students who are listening and I just want to, you know, show them some good, good energy and congratulate all of you for, you know, listening to this session. Um, I think you are your best advocate. So when you can seek out these resources, these connections, these opportunities, you're paying it forward uh, to yourself as you're navigating this journey. And I just wanna say I'm excited for you all. I'm wishing you the best. Please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, there really are people out here who are here to support you like Jack and others, um, because we need you. We need you in medicine and we wanna help you get there. So again, Wawanin and thank you for organizing this today, Jack. Great, thanks. Anybody else? Wonderful. Great, Danielle, 100%. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Please reach Great, out. So you're going you to well. be, be in medicine before you know it, so reach out. To, definitely, you have our contact info, as Danielle said. Reach out, please. That's awesome. You're going to be in medicine before you know it. I love it. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, presenters, for sharing your knowledge, your insights. And um, um, we'll have this up in, um, if you want to review it, <clears throat> we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. We'll send out a, a notice um, after that, at that point. Uh, for the presenters, send me your um, slide decks and we'll give them out to the students and the attendees. All right, thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. <laughs>